Hello and good afternoon. Thanks so much for coming everyone here today. My name is Annika and um, I'm the dir co-director of ArtSwitch. We are a nonprofit based between Amsterdam and New York and are focused on climate forward strategies in the arts. This is the first day of our festival, Nature Thinking, here in the city, running until October 27th. Please join us for the upcoming events. Um, you can learn more about them and sign up with a QR code at the front desk, if you like. But for now, we're so pleased to be collaborating with House and Worth today uh, on this first event and opening of the festival. Huge shout out and thank you to House and Worth and the programming team, especially to Russell and Carolina for making this possible. Um, yeah, for this first conversation today, we're really, really happy to have Mika, artist Mika Rottenberg and the director of Swiss Institute, uh, Stephanie Hessler, here with us. Two bright minds that have been rethinking the methods of art institutions and artistic practices. Two bright minds that are using their studio and institution as a catalyst for change, while both keeping their feet on the ground and their minds wide open. Mika Rottenberg's practice combines film, architectural installation and sculpture to explore ideas of labor and the production of value. Her latest feature film, Remote, was co-created with Maya Tussi in 2022. Stephanie Hessler wears many different hats. She is a curator, writer, and currently director of the Swiss Institute. Previously, as a director of Kunsthalle Trondheim, she co-led the exhibition Sex Ecology and published her book Prospecting Oceans in 2019. They're both joined uh, by Johanna Rietveld, Art Switch director and House and Words artist Liaison, who will lead the conversation. Um, and lastly, some household notes. The conversation will be recorded and we ask you to mentally to write down some of uh, your questions that come up um, as we will open up the conversation at the end to the audience if time allows. So yeah, I think that's it. Johanna, I'll leave the word or give the word to you. Hello, everyone. Thanks, Anika. Um, yeah, it's great to be here. Thanks, Stephanie and Mika, for joining us. Um, thank you for being here and taking a time out of your day and hour to discover this topic together. We have a lot to discuss. Um, how are you both feeling? <laughs> you had quite the trip today, Mika, right? Yeah, there's a mudslide on the way, so I had to Adapt. Uh, take my electric car and arrive. Uh, yeah. I'm glad we're here and you made it on time. Yeah, um, yeah let's see. Um, one of the contexts for this conversation um, is the installation. Mika, your installation that's going to be opening at our 22nd Street Gallery on November 9th. It's the Roddenberry and an installation of lampshares, so-called lampshares. Um, and so the rotten bar is made of invasive vines and plastic, and this is actually a whole new body of work you've been working on. I'd love to hear, we'd love to hear how you got started working with that material and what brought you to plastic. Mm -hmm. um, reclaimed plastic. <laughs> yes, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> Important um, distinction. <laughs> right. Well, I had a kind of, um, repulsion attraction to plastic for a long time. And um, when, after I finished Remote, which was a feature film conceived in the middle of the, through the pandemic, um, I wanted to kind of rethink my art practice in a way that's more intersectional and think about, you know, my work has always been about production and about the way things are mined and created and the processes around that. Uh, and at some point it became a bit uh, insufficient um, to just uh, reflect and mirror. And I wanted to see if I could use the studio as a little like incubator, as a way to um, conceive perhaps a different way of making stuff, making objects, uh, a way that is perhaps uh, more regenerative rather than destructive and extractive. Um, and, and how to still kind of keep a visual edge um, and still keep like a psychological 
um, space that's not just um, out there and kind of uh, removed, something that's still, anyway, that, so I went through a whole, and then I was approached by uh, Manuela and Ivan if I would design um, a bar staff and kind of small bar for opening for uh, 22nd Street. Uh, right after the opening of Remote. So kind of I dived into that and I've started researching materials and my work has always been about materiality and materialism and materialisms and all the, all these, uh, really thinking about the kind of uh, inherent attraction in material, what is materials, what it, what's our kind of, what's materialism, whatever. A lot of thoughts around that and uh, yeah, I researched different things. I started to make my own bioplastics in the studio. That did not go so well. Uh, <laughs> it went well for a little bit, but then they became really moldy. And they also all look like granola bars. Um, but it was really fun to cook uh, seaweed-based uh, bioplastics. And, um, and then I came across the idea of plastics and recycled plastic and precious plastic, which is um, a Dutch kind of uh, started or, uh, organization that talks about the open source of how to kind of reframe thoughts around plastic rather than a problem, which it is. It's also kind of a natural resource at this point. Uh, so. Um, this guy, David Hacker, developed these small machines that people could actually build, supposedly, in their studios or homes and um, create their own small recycling uh, studio um, because recycling is kind of a failed uh, operation, pretty much. I think only like 18% of plastics actually get recycled. Uh, so his idea to actually bring it to the individuals to be able to to build the machines and all that on the on the internet it looks um, very easy but if you ask Gary Dusek that is precious plastic New York City uh, he actually attempted to build some of these machines I took you it took you what, like four years five years something two okay <laughs> um, and I mean what's great about precious plastic is an open source um, so you could download how how do you make it you whatever you did it kind of works sometimes it goes on fire a little bit and then you're like you know connect it I don't know why and then there's no fire anymore um, and so it's a huge work in in progress um, also, the big thing that we kind of came across was uh, how to mine the plastics, how to get recycled plastics. So that was, uh, there's so much of it, but I think that's where it stuck, um, how to actually get that. And then through some research, I connected uh, with inner city green team uh, uh, led by uh, Bridget Carlton um, that started a recycling program for the Wagner houses in East Harlem. Um, so she, there's no really available recycling for people that live there. There's one recycling bin far away, and so people tend not to recycle because it's far. Uh, so she started a program redeeming points for people um, to recycle in the buildings, uh, receive points uh, in exchange for I think uh, different benefits and food and whatever. Um, so and she's been recycling putting it in the bin but kind of got a bit stuck of what to what to do with the with the plastic and when i contacted her uh it was perfect she actually had in mind already to contact precious plastic um so which is a really underdeveloped thing i think as i said it's pretty much dairy is precious plastic this it's very undeveloped in the us um it's more developed in in europe uh, india uh and uh yeah, other parts of Asia and Africa, but uh, not in the US. It's kind of almost non-existing. Um, so that's that's what I've been up to. Sorry, I've been t and then the invasion rise is a whole other thing. But maybe I would, uh, you know, be quiet for a second. <laughs> this is a great introduction. Um, a lot to unravel, I think. But um, hopefully, everybody has some idea now of this process. Um, and the objects themselves that you've been making are interesting also in the sense that they shares almost to the system you're setting up. Right. Um, and that 
idea that the system in itself is actually the artwork is right. an interesting aspect of what you've been working on at the moment. Right. So the lamps are they're called lamp shares because they're objects to be bought and um, be collected. But I see it as a yeah, like a cycle. So there's no it's not about the object. It's about the system around the object um, and a way to kind of feed the system and keep mining the plastics and um, I think this brings me right to you, Stephanie. Um, seeing the artist studio as a circular system, something that's tied into society that has roots actually not only within its own bubble of the artist practice, but really to the city, its environment as an ecosystem is something you have been doing at the Swiss Institute since you started there. Do you want to tell us about that? Yeah, um, thank you, Johanna and Annika for having me. And of course, Samika for um, the beautiful introduction to your practice. So, um, you know, as a curator, I've been doing a lot of exhibitions about questions of ecology and intersectional ecology, meaning not only speaking about a thing that we consider as nature, but really thinking about nature together with society and thinking about how environmental degradation goes hand in hand with a derogatory view on women, on people of color, who is most affected by climate change, and who is the one, who are the ones that are mostly, you know, causing um, climate change and the negative effects on nature, which are industrialized nations in the global north and our fossil fuel dependency. And this has been really at the core of my curatorial and writing practice. However, a little bit maybe like uh, you, Mika, were saying, I wasn't content any longer in only speaking about these topics. I think it is really important to do so and to raise awareness, but I also think we need to really take into consideration our own actions and the way that we act in this social and natural ecosystem that is the art world and that is any world. And so coming to Swiss Institute, for me it was really um, important to think about how we might conceive of the institution as an ecosystem and to really consider in a very nuanced way our actions and the impacts that we have on our communities, on the, the artists that we work with, on the neighborhood, on the people living there, but also thinking about a more kind of planetary scale. And I say planetary and not global because I really believe that we need to move away from this idea that there is such a thing as an abstract globe where, where you know, trade and goods and so on move in an un, in an even way, in a kind of unhindered way. But to me, the image of the planet, and I borrow the term planetarity from the thinker Gayatri Spivak, considers the planet as a living system that is sticky and it is uneven and it's living, it's unwieldy and it is uneven. And so to me, this question of how we can engage in this um, ecosystem or in the system of planetarity as an institution became really, really important. And we can talk a lot more, I think, about this in terms of plastics as well. Um, and so Together with my team, we um, invited artists into this conversation and asked them, can you help us rethink the institution from an environmental and environmentally conscious perspective? And so we had several responses um, by artists who decided to interfere in the actions of Swiss Institute in the way that we work. So one of them is the artist Helen Mira, who proposed to us that whenever we repaint the interstitial spaces of the gallery, when we deinstall and reinstall artworks and need to cover up the holes left behind, we don't use any new paint, but only leftover or mistake paint. And you can see this commitment now when you come to visit us in the East Village. Um, you can see on the walls all of these stripes in different colors. And I really love this, how this dedication to environmental consciousness manifests on the, um, on the building itself and how it questions the pristine white cube that is somewhat supposedly isolated from real life um, outside of the exhibition space. And then the artist Jenna Sotella um, created a piece for us that is very humorous work, which I think also beautifully relates to your work, Mika, in that she took inspiration from a figure from the Muppet universe, from the Fraggle Rock. <laughs> um, there's a trash heap in the show called Marjorie, and Marjorie is this kind of matronly figure, and um, 
she she's an oracle because everything is deposited in her all the food scraps all the kind of trash so she has access to all of this information and so jenna made a compost for us that we as a staff at swiss institute use and the um, electrochemical processes in the compost the worms we have thousands of worms <laughs> they um, they generate electricity that powers a speaker which in turn transmits oracle messages over the rooftop. And so I think these projects um, are really somewhat exemplary of what we're trying to do. And we've invited other artists now into the conversation as well to help us further this process. At the same time, we have a series of public programs and so on, raising awareness. But we also made, we did a more kind of boring <laughs> or operative um, thing too where we analyzed our co2 footprint and we know now our co2 emissions from the last three years and now we're also developing concrete steps for how to reduce the footprint so for us it's kind of both ways it's both operational but it's also thinking together with artists and with with thinkers from different other fields about um, ways to make public this um, engagement with environmental sustainability it's so interesting and especially also the um, I mean, all the aspects, right? The the circular way you're approaching this, mu as much content as a building, as a footprint, but also the longevity of the artworks you're including. This idea, I don't know when you'll stop with painting the building, or is there a stop to that? Or is it just once it's one big patchwork of paint and it still continues? It will continue. So this is also the the aim, you know, to go away from this rigid notion of this is an exhibition, this is when it begins and this is when it ends, but to really, you know, question that that uh, model as well. And to me, that's part of also a curatorial commitment to exploring different ways of working as a curator or as an institution that come from not the hollow scene, which presupposed certain ideas of stability and of linear progress and growth, but to think about the Anthropocene or the capitalist scene and to really think about how how our actions and processes need to change. And one of those changes, I think, is our relation to temporality, which is interesting in terms of plastic, too, because, of course, plastic is um, was considered such an amazing material because it is, you know, lasting um, for so long, but then that causes a whole different set of problems. And um, I think this is exactly what's so um, you know, difficult, but maybe also um, a fertile starting place for these kinds of conversations that are inevitably coming from this messy situation in which we already are. There's no way to go back to purity or to you know, nature that is not already affected by humans. So I think um, in this sense, plastic and conversations around that are really fascinating. Um. Yeah, I recently came across uh, a book called uh, Plastic Matters yes. by uh, Heather, Heather Davis. Davis. Yeah, uh, which was a lot of the things I've been thinking about. Um, and I love it suddenly that there is a, a book about that. Uh, <laughs> so, um, yeah, this uh, attraction to plastic. I always think about plastic as a very kind of sad material in a way and so bodily. And I think about like, you know, it's basically, I mean, fossil fuels are ancient sunlight and, um, you know, beings that were here uh, that kind of want to circulate, that want to, you know, become part of this circular system that our planet and everything else is, um, but they're kind of trapped in this weird uh, human invented material. Um, and so there's something kind of tragic about it and trapped um, a bit like humans at, at this stage um, and there's something about kind of wanting it to to kind of go back how do you release this like ancient sunlight and allow it to kind of go back to the to the kind of and it is you know it wants to go back and it's going back and it is now you know the things that we supposedly consume consume us back uh, and so what do you do with it instead of like rejecting it and creating your own kind of organic wooden nice bubble like how do you actually engage in it in a way that is um kind of what is that sticky messy um world planet that we live in and and also how do you invent new systems because it's really important time to invent new systems in a way and uh there's no going back to this divisive um 
way of looking at things and and um rather than and being stuck in in, in that um binary in a way uh, way of op operating and being rather than as artists at least coming up with um new stories or new systems you know and especially you know as a small artist studio or like a small institution we have so much um you know freedom in a way um and privilege to do that uh so i i find that is really like a fascinating space to be experimental in that way um and I find it so interesting because I feel that your work has been doing this for 20 years, even though it hasn't been so explicit, perhaps. But, uh, you know, with um, with the video installation Tropical Breeze, for example, um, I was looking at your book from 2011, which was published as part of your The Apple Show. Mm -hmm. And you have these beautiful sketches in there where you were thinking about how to create your own economy. Right. And so sweat um, as being kind of the measure of productivity of one of the characters was a part of that. And then you had ideas of, you know, um, of course, labor, um, gender and so on were really present already in your work back then. Um, and you also always considered yourself as being, you know, you can't be outside of this kind of system. Um, but now you also moved, and actually already back then you had a foundation, Infinite Earth, and now moving toward um, the plastic, the, you know, reuse of plastic. I think it's so fascinating that you always try to somewhat grapple with the material realities that you were addressing in your work, but also in the making of your work. Right. Yeah, with Sweat, it was surplus, you know. Another book I came across, across the Capital, that was actually capturing things I was thinking. <laughs> it was like, oh, someone wrote a book about that. But, uh, you know, what? how do you um, uh, define value? Like, what makes something valuable? How are prices, you know, whatever. And that was when I was undergrad. Um, but, and then thinking about surplus and thinking, oh, and alchemy, so from a different direction too, but like, how do you turn something that is, um, entropy or, or surplus uh well it's the anyway and, and turn it into a value so in tropical breeze for example it was heather foster that's a bodybuilder so her sweat was also valuable for her fans and um, this was uh, ebay just started so uh because it was early 2000 and so i wanted to create an object that is between that's basically her sweat like five minutes of her sweat time as tissue boxes and then offer it on eBay as either an art object or something for her fans, like her t-shirt, but like her sweat. Uh, but really thinking about something that is uh, useless and uh, making it uh, useful in a way or valuable. So the same thing with plastic um, and plastic. Yeah, and then this whole conversation around plastic and, and gender and hormones and this kind of queer ecology. And that's really interesting too. Of, um, something also th through that book I've been um, thinking about and um, I think that from the plastic perspective too it has this inherent idea that it's the temporality of it of its making but also of its use usage is so different right so it inherently actually is thrown away we see it all the time with these bags that you use one time for a material that has been in the making for so long and will take so long to disappear is incredible actually and being able to reshift that i think that that somewhat also just in the plasticity of plastic that you can reshape it as much reshape its format as, as also its approach that we have to it that uh, like attraction repulsion you were talking uh, about before um and i'm curious to hear your thoughts about that the the object that you're creating in that sense of the plastic how you're seeing that that its temporality and its um, its agency as a communicator between also its materiality, you and the audience that will perceive it. Right. Yeah, I mean, I, it's always for me about the aura around the art object and the, the process and not the object itself. The object is kind of a vehicle for the story. Um, in this case, the object is the lamps and the bigger bar that also has the invasive vines. But for the lamps, you know, there are, uh, they're kind of a system to build stuff. So these like sticks and blobs that you could kind of endlessly put together. In this case, they're the lamps. Uh, they're HDPE 
plastics and now I know all about the different kinds of plastics and all that and uh, so it's HDPE uh, and the top is P polypropylene so high density polyethylene and uh, polypropylene is the, lem the the top of it so they could be recycled um, you can have one um, and enjoy it and in the end of its life which might be 30 years 50 years when it's not as shiny and nice you could suppose like you could uh, recycle it again you know if that you know by then maybe that would be everybody will have a little machine to do that <laughs> um, and you know it's also working with the purity uh, of the I mean, I'm trying to avoid using that term but the plastics themselves you don't want to mix the different kinds I mean as you know on the on the back there's number two number five all these so not to mix them and thinking about uh, not adding more things to them so the process is kind of uh, smooth and doesn't release more chemicals and and all that but the process itself is really fascinating because uh, the, most of the things we process is um, detergent, big detergent cases that have beautiful colors and it's really satisfying to kind of pull them out of the dumpster and then uh, divide them to colors, uh, shred them and then basically kind of create this um, natural resource then to to use and I think that the attraction is the plasticity plasticity of plastic I think this material that kind of doesn't have a shape of its own that's kind of formless and shapeless and um, kind of bodily and could be kind of molded uh, uh, into various shapes um, and the way that we process it as we feed it through tubes and then we kind of let it kind of do its thing too. So there's also this idea of kind of molding it and then kind of releasing it to let it do its thing. So each one is completely unique and now we've been experimenting with adding different colors and all that. Or oh, we never add any kind of pigment so it's all from whatever's mind. Um, so each one is kind of like a gemstone in a way and super unique and each blob is has its own kind of um, you know, shape and, and all that, and you know, so that's pretty cool. There's a lot of pink in there, and there's a lot a of pink. Pink is actually yeah. a really hard one to to get. Uh, yeah, uh, yeah. It's very bodily. I think we we had a close up on the flyer, which I'm sure you saw, and um, yeah, it's even the fact that it comes out of these tubes and the way you twist them. Yeah, they it's all it's kind of look look like sex toys, you know. <laughs> Somehow that happened, uh, and um, and that's pretty cool. Guess we're <laughs> back to queer college, <laughs> right? <laughs> yeah. um, I'd love to hear you uh, the ex about more about the exhibition you've been uh, that you made sex ecologies at Trondheim, and both I think content wise, but also especially also the method you use, which I believe was quite unique or precursor, and maybe something you're doing again now. Yeah, um, so the exhibition Sex Ecologies was a show that I um, co-led in 2021 looking at queer ecology, so the intersection of gender and ecology and maybe I should say a few words about ecofeminism first, just to kind of introduce this idea. So um, this term ecofeminism was coined in 1974 by um, a scholar called Françoise Dorbonne to point to the intersection of the uh, domination of nature and of women and how those mutually intersect. And then in the years after um, this concept was first introduced, many artists and also scholars began working on this idea. And then in 1989, when Kimberly um, Crenshaw coined the term intersectionality, this term also helped to make the uh, conversations around ecofeminism a lot more open and inclusive, um, considering not only gender, but also class, race, disability, and so on, as part of that conversation. And out of that came this term queer ecology, to really think about nature as not this kind of pure um, or normative thing, but to look at how nature is already always affected by humans and humans are affected by nature in turn, and how all of these queer relationships or what might be called queer relationships emerge out of that. And so the exhibition Sex Ecologies um, asked whether the term queer <laughs> is actually really so suited for that um, or if we should much more consider 
um, the word sex as something active. So to avoid essentialism or to avoid this, you know, freezing of, okay, this thing is queer and this thing isn't, but to really think about it more as a process. And so this exhibition worked with nine um, artists that we invited who came from all over the world <laughs> to respond to this idea of, um, of what sex ecologies might be. And we um, read different texts together, we annotated them in the publication um, that came out, which is more of a compendium that uh, was published by MIT Press. Um, and, and each of the artists also developed work for the exhibition coming out of those conversations. We also invited a group of interdisciplinary researchers from the fields of environmental humanities, gender, uh, gender studies, indigenous scholarship, media communication studies into the conversations. And so we workshopped the ideas with the artists. And I thought I could maybe mention one of the artworks coming out of that because it relates also to one of your works, Mika. Um, so the artist Jess Fan made a project together with a um, with a researcher at the University of Hong Kong, uh, Professor Jan Batad, who was researching oysters. And uh, Jess developed an artwork where they introduced four Chinese letters into oysters, which were then absorbed because, as you know, um, pearls are created by oysters because of a certain disturbance in the oyster. Normally, it's like a sand grain. And so Jess inserted those four letters in the oyster who then responded to that and integrated that into the mother of pearl. And the words read um, Pearl of the East, which is the British moniker for the colony of Hong Kong when it was under British um, protectorate. And then um, the, the work was shown as photographs on uh, fabric in the space. And we mentioned briefly this, um, you know, how plastics and um, how there's endocrine disruptors in groundwater and in the early 2010s and so on. There was this big anxiety in environmentalist discourse of how various birds, for example, change their sexual behavior um, because of pollution in the water. But a lot of the language that was used for this was very um, homo and transphobic. So this also points somewhat to this, you know, our um, ideas of nature as being very normative in the same way that ideas of gender are, of course, still very normative. And, um, and so Jess Fan actually asked the question of what a productive form of contamination might be, or if there is such a thing. So to go away from saying that contamination is necessarily bad and something else is necessarily good, which is not to say that pollution is, of course, something that we should avoid, but nonetheless to ask somebody, you know, coming out of this messy and already polluted place where we add what might emerge out of that. And, um, and so, yeah, this idea of, of our relationship with contamination and toxicity and how we might redefine that relationship, I think, was really interesting. And of course, you, Mika, have also made work mm -hmm. with uh, this idea and with oysters and, and pearls. And you mentioned the word alchemy earlier, how out of this disturbance, something so valuable is being produced, which is the pearl. So yeah, I, yeah, that's what I was so fascinated by the irritant that produces, you know, value. Um, kind of thinking, hopefully, art could be that in a way, in a way, like irritate culture in a way to produce value rather than to, you know, cancel it. Um, so that that's a really interesting um, idea of also what's natural. And in the oysters case, um, it's. Uh, the actual oyster is fed to the oyster to create irritation. And that's how they're doing it now, from what I understand, or at least the places I visited. Um, but it's also, this thinking is interesting because it's, it's really kind of working with what is, rather than kind of labeling good, bad, or against, pro, that the whole thing is actually working with what is and seeing how can you kind of transcend that or work with that in order to, again, maybe reshape it into something else that is maybe has a different form of progress, uh, again, that is regenerative rather than destructive um, and, and kind of connected to each other rather than, than binary and, and the, the accusatory, um, but kind of dealing with the facts, you know, as difficult as they might be, um, kind of dealing with, 
you know, what do you do? And I think in life and pollution and politics, it's really difficult. Um, but uh, in art, you know, maybe it's a little possible. Like you can allow play there, you know, uh, because it is that for me that what art is is that space of um, a bit of removal. Um, you know, kind of like a metal looking and a bit of a removal in order to allow play, even in the most kind of difficult or um, tragic situations, you know. So, yeah, really kind of dealing with, with what is. I like this idea also of the not either or, but the and also, you know, the attraction and repulsion to this material. In the um, Sex Ecologies publication, the gender and environmental humanities scholar Astrida Neyman is, writes about toxic love and she describes um, a moment in the um, Windermere Basin in Ontario, Canada where she goes for walks and she encounters all of these detritus and you know um, plastic waste and describes how how this um, you know, the, the treating this water basin as a dump is also a form of reproduction, which reproduces a different kind of um, nature. And so how we might move away from considering nature as only one thing, but not another, and how she is still, she describes how she's still feeling um, this attraction and love for this place, even though it is incredibly polluted. And she asked what kind of relationships might emerge out of this engagement, which is a lot more complex, right, than, than simply to reject, but to say that this is what it is. What can we, what, what comes next? What can come out of this situation? Right. Yeah, and like back to the idea of like footprint and um, can you create, and there are a lot of materials that are being developed that instead of adding a footprint in one way or another, they're using, uh, what is problematic in as a source material so you know this carbon observing concrete and and um plastic made out of seaweed seaweed itself kind of uh, does that like sucks kind of carbon uh from the atmosphere very quickly um all these materials so uh thinking about not just reducing harm but um in fantasy, you know, and in like fantastical science that's real but not approachable, um, that kind of movement, you know, is, is possible. Again, when I try to research it and have access to these materials, they're not accessible, they're really expensive and they're really kind of out there. Um, that's why I kind of ended with things that were around me. Um, but uh, again, since we're not like designers, it's supposed to it could need to scale everything lo on like an individual object. That kind of um, thinking is um, is interesting, and you know, there's also the edge of it. So there's an edginess to it because it's not. It's again working with, with what is and um, and not creating this like pure space that's like avoiding and the that. collective in a way too you know because your work also with the various uh, groups that you mentioned is also not only you as an artist but also working together with with communities which i think is so interesting there's there's several artists i think who are doing this at the moment i mean autobong kanga has a project as well that is about um that's producing soap and it connects to an exhibition space in um in athens which is called which is named after the village where her grandfather is from in Nigeria. Mm -hmm. So it's connecting these geographies. Yeah. Um, the space is called Aqua Ibom. Yeah. And, uh, and these soaps that are created are also sold. And so there's also, you know, um, revenue being returned to communities. So I think there's different ways to engage in a collective way or to imagine different cooperative forms of economies. And this is what you're doing with the Lamp Shares project too, and there's several other, other artists as well. So I think that's, you know, applying some of these learnings at least temporarily and to experiment with different forms of economy. I think it's also relating to what we might imagine coming out of this moment. Yeah, absolutely. And just one thing is also that I'm really interested in the visual and the psychology of the visual. Um, so for me also that how the lamps or these objects look like are really important too. So uh, kind of not to just create a system, which is also super interesting that 
avoids the object or the attraction to the object uh, or the, on one, the ownership of the object uh, and the, vi the surface quality of the object and the materiality of the object. Uh, all these things I'm super interested in because you know I'm a visual artist. So how do you create that kind of conceptual relation or aesthetic work, but with the kind of a visual, rich li visual language is also. In that sense, I feel like this this place of the artist studio as a messy like place of invention of finding new structures, but also of humor is something that really characterizes what you have been doing and are doing now with these lampshades too. Um, it's interesting how much that, um, how m at least in the work we've been doing with Art Switch too, we've been seeing how much um, responsibility in that sense is put on artists or expectation almost from art organizations that are trying to implement change and become more sustainable, uh, that there's this expectation of artists being the front runners and the ones that can bring these new ideas, which I think is a bu it's great, you know, and you are doing it, but it's, it's a heavy load for yeah. a small amount of people. And as you say, also limited resources. I mean, it was a lot of work to find Gary and put precious plastics up here. And how do you do that on a small scale and the limitations that you have in that sense? Um, and that I think still is something that we have to figure out as our organization still, if what, how do you find that balance? And um, how also as a curator, the role that you play in that, I'm curious to hear how you've been finding that balance within your work um, of knowing how to support artists in that sense that are having these forward-thinking ideas and messages, but at the same time not put the sole responsibility on them. Yeah, I think that's really key. And you know, I always say that the process is imperfect, but it's urgent that we try it anyway. And um, for me and for us at Swiss Institute, there's also you know, a way for us to support artists through these questions by taking more responsibility as an institution too. Because it's not just a one-sided conversation where we ask artists to make changes and then we do not, or where we kind of outsource all, all the responsibility to the artists, but we also ask, okay, what can we do? This is why, you know, these projects that I described earlier, I actually think of them as a way of yeah, taking environment or considering what an environmental institutional critique might be and um, really bringing it back into the institution and thinking of it as a holistic process rather than saying that it's only the artist who needs to consider it. But very practically speaking, we also ask the artist, you know, if they might consider, for example, if um, there's a video projection, do we need a carpet? If we do need a carpet, there's different ways of making the carpet reusable. So, you know, we, we think in different layers and it's not an absolute way of saying like, no, none of this or none of that, but really thinking in a nuanced way. And then also considering for all of the um, emissions that we can't re um, you know, reduce, thinking about ways to compensate by donating to organizations who directly support people um, most affected by climate change. So there's different ways to think in a circular or holistic way about these questions that are not categorical. And I think that's really important because I feel that the conversation has moved to a place now where we can be more nuanced and more, um, you know, maybe yeah, making more nuanced decisions that are taking into consideration not just one aspect, which might be ecology or nature, but also taking into consideration the social implications of uh, of our decision making. Yeah, I don't. Yeah, it's it's there's a lot of <clears throat> uh, closed walls. I think when you try to change, but it's also liberating in a way because. Um, it's really interesting to to think about new systems and new ways that one could do things. Uh, it's also, for me at least, there is like, there's, I know the system as is doesn't really work. You know, it's not functioning, and it's really it's psychologically you know sad to be trapped in it. And I think my work has been a lot about kind of being trapped in the systems and not being able to to get out. So. If there's like a little hole where you could maybe get out of, you know, I mean, that's pretty fun, you know, to try. <laughs> I like where we've been turning around a bit about around the concept of an ecological aesthetic. And that's something that came up during our conversation. Um, I think we've maybe as a last thought um, before we go to Q&A. Um, 
we've been talking about a few characteristics characteristics here um messiness there's humor um there's the idea also that somehow the content and the aesthetic have are coming together right it's not only about a message but there's an object that attracts you to um and in there also comes the importance and even the 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 message the the ethical implications of the material you use too and i'm wondering if you have any thoughts on this direction um, of ecological aesthetic? Yeah, I mean, I don't know if there's an answer of, okay, this would be an ecological aesthetics. For me, the one of the concepts I keep returning to is process, you know, asking maybe about not so much the outcome or the object in and of itself, but really thinking about the process. And that's also what we do in the institution. Um, and then the other thing I will say is that, you know, I think it's also about representation. This is a big question I keep coming back to as well. So, um, which is not only the case for the climate crisis, but for many other important issues too, is what can we represent and how can we do so? Just to give an example, since we've been speaking about plastic, so, you know, the great Pacific Ocean um, garbage patch is actually not so much um, large pieces of plastic. They are there too, but it's mostly these minuscule, um, you know, microplastics that end up in the water, that end up in our food and our blood and so on. And they're not visible. And this has been one of the big questions of climate change, how to make visible something that is, you know, what, um, what is this, what Rob Nixon calls slow violence, right? So it's kind of dispersed in time and in place, and it's not really immediately felt always. Sometimes it is, not always. Um, and and how do we represent that? And what are the limits of such representation of trying to represent something that is so vast and so urgent, right? And um, is it even possible? And so to me, that's one of the, the big questions. And there's other ways too to approach this, which are not about showing a picture of a melting glacier, but you know, uh, really you know engaging in uh, in these conversations in a different way. And I think that um, there's many different aesthetics. Um, and many different ways of doing it. But those are the questions, not the answers, but the questions I keep coming back to. Yeah, no, absolutely. I think that's the time to invent uh, or develop these kind of um, new aesthetics and and also question uh, our attraction, repulsion to, you know, brightness and to um, all these other things that are uh, that are still in our current kind of culture. So how do you um, start creating uh, the kind of seeds to a new kind of culture? Um, yeah, and I think that's for each of us to, to figure out. <laughs> Thank yeah. you both. Mm -hmm. um, are there questions from the audience? Yes. Thank you. Hi. Um, thank you, everybody. It's been great. Um, Mika, um, in... Um, in addition to um, a, um, the the questions of uh, materialism in your work, I've always felt that there have been um, it's been a strong sense of uh, place and location um, across your work. You know, be like Florida, Mexico, so on and so forth. And um, um, you know, like plastic um, is so ubiquitous, but you know, I think it can also be thought of as almost like uh, migratory. You know, like you know, it like goes out to the ocean. Now we're like trying to, you know, figure out like how we can get it back home onto land. And uh, I'm curious if you have any thoughts about uh, the place of plastic. Mm -hmm. That's interesting. I haven't thought about it in sense of um, a place. Uh, the up for me was also looking at kind of what's immediately around me. Um, and thinking about kind of the migration of it uh, from more like states of matter, you know, like how, how it would turn and reshape and all that. So um, I think it's more and more not so much um, horizontal kind of thinking of a place, it's more vertical thinking about s place <laughs> and kind of um, transcending or moving between different states. Um, so, so so does that like i think if if in the videos it's more about okay this thing is made here this is the natural resources um uh are coming from another place and then it's reshaped and being ended up in my my body this is all kind of what's in my immediate surrounding and how i could kind of you know um, 
throw it up in a way <laughs> that uh, would then have a different life. But it is interesting to think about a, a connection to, to a space, a place. I think maybe one thing, um, if not a question was to you, <laughs> but um, I think that's yeah, also a question of, you know, the not just the geography, but also where are they actually, where the plastics are visible and where not, because they're not so visible here, but they're very visible in, you know, um, low income communities and in um, the global south and plastic washes up on the shores and it's not immediately cleaned away and people have to live with it. So there's also something to be said about, you know, not just the geographies of the production and consumption of plastic, but also who has to live with them and where is it visible and where is it not. Yeah, and I would add, it's like, it's in our blood, right? Microplastics now, it's, it's everywhere. It's this material that at the same time has forms that you don't see. And then also we just cannot seem to get rid of it. Um, yeah. This is really weird dialectic there. Um, Everywhere. <laughs> <laughs> Any more questions? Hi, um, Mika. I love your work. Um, I I was super inspired 15 years ago in school, <laughs> um, and I I am very familiar with pieces like cheese and dough. Lately, I, I don't know what you're doing, honestly, <laughs> but and I came late. But as I was listening, I was thinking um, that we, because of this pressure of climate change, now it seems that everybody is doing work <laughs> about ecology and the Anthropocene and green thinking, right, and trying to critique and, and find a solution. Um, and I mean, I, I don't know, I, I think, I mean, just as an outsider, seeing your work before, like cheese or dough, um, I don't know if you were thinking about ecology back then. Um, and and the, it's a question um, that I have for myself. I don't know if you can comment on it. Is how to how to engage in this crisis without following in this <laughs> kind of like trend of like ecology and, and it becomes kind of like a brand. And I'm very scared of those things, just such as a couple of years ago about like, you know, Black Lives Matter or any of these things that really affect and have an impact in, in the art world, in, in everybody's life. And I'm sure with our current political situation all over, then we're gonna have a lot of art talking about, you know, these horrible things that are happening now. So how do we escape, you know, our, or, or I don't, I, don't, I, I think, um, yeah, I'm curious to know how you are processing this? Yeah, I, I don't know. I mean, I'm happy those, these things kind of surface up. Um, so I don't know if I'm thinking about them as, as trends. I think for I've always been interested in maybe not, I, I didn't maybe call it ecology, but more economy, which is kind of very similar in a way. Um, and about, again, the, these circular systems and creation of value and what's devalued and what's valued and and the way humans uh, extract and interact with the environment and how they're actually one, that there is no kind of, um, that they're a mesh together and they're the same thing in a way. Um, so it, it would be great if, you know, more people would kind of uh, make work about all these things and try to think creatively about different ways to make them uh, surface and be visible and um, kind of different perspectives on these and kind of teach each other and show each other um, different ways. So I, I don't necessarily see that uh, as a problem if it comes from, you know, like a trend. I think it's, I mean, those things, I think should should surface and should be kind of digested in in this way. Any other questions? Hi, Mika. Hi, everybody. Thank you for this. It was wonderful, um, Mika. I also love your work so much. Um, and I'm thinking about a distinction that's always mattered to me a lot from a teaching curatorial perspective as somebody who's done that for many years. 
Um, what I particularly love in your work is the, the, the irritant, the attractive, repulsive irritant in the way it embody, it, it gets itself into the system of somebody perceiving the work and responding to the work. And I've always been drawn to curating that draws in people who are not there anticipating already what they want to take from a work, but are actually drawn into something unfamiliar, unprocessable, that enters their system and does work. And I think that I'm also extremely interested in all the political issues and the defining of terms and all that, but I've always had a resistance to the rush to kind of collapse the process, the, the interval between that indirect, unclear, but powerful, sharp in its own way. Would, um, you, would you mind asking your question, please? Sorry, so what I'm trying to say is I feel like, do you, think about the distinction between w uh, what is it that you most hope for in a viewer? Because I think sometimes there's a big hurry to show the way that a work has real political or social impact. And in fact, there might be a another value. Right, I guess it's back to maybe verbal language that, and trying to kind of come for a conclusion rather than um, it's, if something is an irritant and you're not sure how to kind of digest it or it's undigestible, um, maybe being comfortable with that space rather than immediately kind of uh, trapping it and defining it. And I think that's what you're kind of talking about, letting something um, kind of uh, exist in, in that space um, that is maybe not uh, a verbal space. Uh, and I hope that art kind of does that on on its own and then there's like parallel situations where it inspires writing or it inspired all these other things but one thing doesn't um, kind of is superior or seeks to explain it. It's just kind of is an, an inspiration. Thank you. I'd love to keep it at that note of art as a place of change, a catalyst, an inspiration but also a place of humor. I think we kind of ticked all those boxes in this conversation. Um, I'd like to thank you all for being here and going on the journey of this conversation with us. It's the last day of the two exhibitions at the 22nd Street. If you want to go have a look, um, there. this is the last day. And Mika, your installation in the bottom bar is opening on November 9th. So please come and see what it actually looks, what the materials look like. Um, we are traveling also next week to the Swiss Institute with our Art Switch event, so I invite you all to come to our conversation on Thursday at 7 p.m. and also explore the wonderful exhibitions that are there at the moment. Um, we've organized a small get-together and drinks uh, at Twist Bar at 9th Avenue and 20th Street for whoever wants to join for, for a small drink. Um, and if you walk out outside, there's a QR code on the bar that can link you to the RSVP to any more events um, of Art Switch, our Nature Thinking Festival, this week and next. Um, thank you both so much for joining the conversation and how's Enworth for hosting us. Um, yeah, that's it.